it's even better. So I'll be the host, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, check the time. Each paper, paper session is 20 minutes, and afterwards I'll ask if there's any questions. And we also have 10 minutes at the end for further questions if you have, have them. Uh, at first we have Helene Sedstrom Dahlqvist. Uh, dimensions of peer sexual harassment and depressive symptoms in adolescence, a longitudinal cross legged study in a Swedish sample. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Yeah, so you, you nailed my title there, so I don't have to. <laughs> so just a few where, where I come from. Um, Mid-Sweden University comes to, as no surprise, it's in the middle of Sweden. Um, and this is where I usually spend my time, at campus Sundsvall. Um, so, uh, first a few words about what we have studied. So, depressive symptoms is one of the things we studied in this study. And it's not equal to major depressive disorder. It doesn't mean that these pupils, the students, have a diagnosis. Uh, rather, depressive symptoms should be seen as a risk factor for later depression in the clinical sense. Uh, some of the students in our data may have depression in the clinical sense, but there's no way that we can tell from our data if they have. Um, just so you know, this is not, the, most of these students are not severe, severely ill. It's depressive symptoms, okay? So just keep that in mind. Um, poor health and depressive symptoms, depression in adolescent is an urgent public health issue worldwide. And the WHO states that it's the worldwide leading cause of illness and disability in young people uh, with higher rates among girls. Um, explanations for poor mental health, it's of course, uh, multifactorial, um, all kinds of things, socioeconomic influences, maternal depression, very important, disrupted family situation, parental immigrant background has been shown to be a factor, pubertal timing, poor social relationships, peers, parents and teachers, and interpersonal violence. And there I have, including bullying, including cyberbullying, but also sexual harassment and dating violence. Now, there's a quite a big body of uh, research uh, regarding bullying and associations to poor mental health. Um, not that much done on sexual harassment. Um, so, we thought we should do something. Uh, but first, sexual harassment. <coughs> It's very common, depending on age and setting, and of course, how you frame sexual harassment. Um, 45 to 96 percent of students worldwide um, has a lifetime prevalence report reported of sexual harassment. Uh, there's an American study who, <coughs> uh, the Lara, she actually went out to high schools and talked to kids, and they said, you just have to learn to live with it. It's on an everyday basis. It can happen to anyone, anytime. You just have to learn to live with it. Um, we look at it as a form of gender-based violence. Um, and a previous study that we did showed no gender difference in victimization. T when we looked at ever, never, those who have never been victimized or in the past six months, or those who had, t when we take all types of harassments taken together, no gender differences. The differences start to appear when we look at different types of harassment, okay? Perpetrators are more commonly boys, but girls do perpetrate sexual harassment too. Um, there has been shown that um, when girls are perpetrators, it's an act of retaliation that is results of victimization. So as a girl, you're first victimized and then you want to get even, okay? For boys, it's usually the other way around. You victimize somebody else and then you get it right back at you. 
Um, and a few words about bullying and sexual harassment as quite different concepts. Uh, after lunch in the keynote, uh, Dr. Hong was talking about um, homophobic bullying. In our way of conceptualizing this, homophobic name calling or it's a part of sexual harassment. Uh, this is some data from our larger study. Um, I'm not going to go into how we have measured bullying, but ha it has no constructs of sexual harassment or homophobic parts in it, okay? And as you can see, sexual harassment is more common, and there are some students that are victimized by both. But there's a large, almost 30% of the students in grade seven to nine in 2011 that were sexually harassed, that weren't bullied at all in the past six months. Okay. So sexual harassment seems to be a little bit different than bullying, and sometimes it co-occurs. Um, when you're researching uh, sexual harassment in connection to poor mental health, you get into um, a discourse, the psychology field, and more precise developmental psychology. And a common discourse is that sexual harassment is due to immature uh, interactions with the opposite sex or and or a part of uh, general externalizing behavior. We strongly believe that this explanatory model is insufficient. There, be, th there, may, there may be a part of the explanation about what sexual harassment is, but if it really was only about immature interactions with the opposite sex, um, that cannot explain why we also have sexual harassment at the workplace, which is really common too, and it doesn't make any sense that so many people never grow up. <laughs> so, we suggest to add a gender theoretical approach. Um, and sexual harassment as a social cultural construction of gender, sexuality, and power relations. And um, Dr. Hung was talking about heteronormativity. And he didn't mention policing gender, but it's pretty much what's it about. Um, it's when boys victimizes boys for not showing an hegemonic masculinity, which is usually heterosexual. Okay, the hegemonic is the one who is privileged, who has the highest status, okay? And this also in school reflects society in a whole, usually. He was talking about the Mason macrosystems and the eco social ecological systems. And so this is reproduced and mirrored in school, okay? And hegemonic heterosexual masculinity as dominant. It's rarely, rarely about sexual interest. There's a lot of research regarding that. Sometimes it is, but not usually. And it has been shown how boys actually use sexual harassment to put girls in place when power relations are challenged. Or to police other boys who are not showing a hegemonic heterosexual masculinity. They, you know, we heard about it, faggot, gay, oh, that's so gay. Okay, it's sort of policing gender. Um, also, uh, Felix and McMahon shown, show that being victimized by a girl has no impact on internalizing or externalizing behaviors in boys nor in girls. Okay, so being victimized by a girl by sexual harassment doesn't really mean much because the power, power relations are, aren't really being challenged or, or um, established. So our study, um, we looked at this from a theoretical, uh, gender theoretical approach and we consider sexual harassment as an assertion of male dominance and asymmetric power relations. And we think that this contributes to the understanding of who is being victimized by sexual harassment, 
how dimensions of depressive symptoms are associated with different dimensions of sexual harassment over time, and how gender influences such associations. The aim was to test competing models in respect of the direction of the relationships between dimensions of peer sexual harassment victimization and dimensions of depressive symptoms in the ages 14 to 16, and that's grade 7 to 9 in the Swedish context. Um, we use data from um, a larger study, the Youth Health Development Study in the northern part of Sweden, um, we use data from three waves, 10, 11, and 12, and this is a municipality with about 60,000 inhabitants. All public schools took part in one of four independent schools in this area. Well, electronic questionnaires in three waves, fairly good response rates, and at the first wave there were 1,400 students, and some lost to follow up. Um, we measured depressive symptoms with the Center for Epidemiologic Studies Depression Scale, which is commonly used in adolescents' population for epidemiological purposes, not for diagnosis, okay? And it's a scale range from <laughs> 0 to 60, so the more points you get, the more depressive symptoms you have. And we found three dimensions, negative effect, psychosomatic symptoms, and anhedonia. And anhedonia is you don't really feel up to doing stuff. What used to be interesting for you is not interesting anymore. Things like that. Um, now, sexual harassment. <coughs> we ask students to indicate um, how often have you experienced each behavior, never once, a few times, many times, against your will, that's crucial, okay, during the past six months. And you can just take a moment to read this for yourself. It's 14 different types of harassments. And there you have the homophobic um, name calling that we've been talking about earlier today. And there are three dimensions of this, physical harassment, name calling, usually homophobic or otherwise, or what we call public display. That means that it's, it's done publicly, you have sort of an audience. Uh, other people see what's going on. Oh, so what we tried to do um, really was the hen and the egg problem. What comes first? Sexual harassment and then you feel bad or do you first feel bad and then you're harassed? So really, um, this is a terrible picture, but um, so this is over time. Um, we have depressive symptoms here, sexual harassment here over time. So up there is grade seven, in the middle grade eight, and here's grade nine. And these bubbles are the different dimensions of depressive symptoms, different dimensions of sexual harassment, okay? And we just wanted to see what comes first. Are there any associations between these two? And if there is, is it that sexual harassment precedes depressive symptoms, or is it the other way around, or does it go both ways? So competing models, really. What model fits the data best? And we adjusted for some socioeconomic uh, variables. So, here, okay, so I'll try to help you interpret this. Here we have the dimensions of depressive symptoms and we have dimensions of sexual harassment. We have boys and we have girls. The O stands for there, there is no um, better model than just stability over time. That is, if you have depressive symptoms in grade seven, you have it in grade eight, and you have it in grade nine. And that's the best way to describe this data, just stability over time. That's what O means. B means it's bi-directional. It goes like this, it goes both ways. Some get harassed and then have depressive symptoms. Some have depressive symptoms and then get harassed. 
and uh, SH stands for that sexual harassment pre precedes the present symptoms, and D stands for the present symptoms precede sexual harassment. So when we start with boys down here, you can see there's a lot of O's, and then there are some D's. Um, so that means that for boys, name calling um, and all dimensions of depressive symptoms are associated in the way that depressive symptoms precedes sexual harassment. That means boys who already are vulnerable in the sense that they have depressive symptoms or they report depressive symptoms are the one being targeted by name calling and predominantly by homophobic um, name calling. Now, that model did not have a significant difference compared to the baseline model, the, the just stability over time model. So we need to be careful when we're interpreting the data for boys. Now the girls, the picture is a little bit more complicated. As you can see, the public display could not, um, did not fit data better than the stability model. And then you have a B, bidirectional. Physical harassment and somatic symptoms goes both ways. Now in our data, this means that there are some girls that are physically harassed and then particularly report somatic symptoms that is a part of the, the depression symptoms. And there are other girls that already have somatic symptoms and, subsequent, and subsequently is victimized by physical harassment. This is sort of mind blowing and I don't really know how to interpret it, this, but I have discussed it with embodiment processes and what is going on. Um, and then we have name calling, also important for girls. And it's a little bit different whether when it comes to anhedonia, it, it's girls who are not feeling very well that are victimized by name calling. But when it comes to somatic symptoms and negative effect, uh, sexual harassment comes first, okay? And then the strength of these associations. So we measure this in three ways, one year in between, okay? And we find associations over one year of these associations. This in blue, we have girls and we have boys. And we have grade seven to grade eight and grade eight to grade nine. And as you can see, sexual har physical sexual harassment um, it's stable over time in girls, not so stable in boys, but sexual name calling is stable in both gender over time. Um, somatic depressive symptoms and negative effect and anhedonia um, are stable over time in both girls and boys. And then we come to the cross lag findings. And as you can see, for the boys, there are no significant loadings, really, coefficient loadings. Uh, but there are some for girls. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, and they're not very strong, but remember, it's a year between measure points, OK? Yeah. So it's, this confirms the previous picture. It's just the strength of the associations aren't that strong, small or medium. And I think we would get stronger association if we measured it more frequently. Okay. So conclusions. Being sexually harassed had long-term effects on depressive symptoms for girls, while for boys no effects on depressive symptoms could be shown. Sexual harassment was not stable over time in boys, and it is possible that for a boy, being victimized may even confirm, confirm a hegemonic heterosexual masculinity. I don't know. It needs to be studied further. Um, some girls are vulnerable, that is having depressive symptoms, both as a result of sexual harassment and are being victimized because they are vulnerable, okay? So it's a quite complicated picture. Boys are victimized by mostly homophobic name calling, mainly because they are vulnerable, that is having depressive symptoms um, and hence not displaying a hegemonic heterosexual masculinity. 
And understanding sexual harassment from a developmental um, perspective only would obscure the understanding of how sexual harassment is being used in terms of establishing and reinforcing asymmetric power relations. Um, we elaborate on this more in the article. Implications, um, addressing name calling, very important for both boys and girls. Um, it would protect vulnerable students from additional harm and protect girls in particular from developing depressive symptoms in the first place. And it would help undermine socially constructed and privileged notions of heterosexual masculinity and would most likely be beneficial to girls and boys alike. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. You were exactly 20 minutes. That was impressive.